Hi everybody, I'm Andrew Locke. Welcome to Gaffering Gear. Today it's another gear review and we're looking at the projection attachment from Nanlite for their Forza 500s and Forza 300s. So if you don't know what a projection attachment is, well, it allows you to do precise adjustment of the light. It also allows you to project patterns. And in the case of this unit, which has a 19 degree barrel, you can throw the light a very long distance. All right, so before we get underway, just a few things. Um, this is a sample unit supplied to me by Protog, who are the Australian distributor of Nanlite products. So I only have the 19 degree barrel, so I can't have a look at the 36 degree. So you've got a choice of 19 degree or 36 degree. Now, what some of you are gonna to wanna to know straight away, uh, some of you have um, aperture 600Ds and 600Xs, and you're gonna to wanna to know if you can mount the aperture 600D or X onto the back of this, and you can't. So despite the fact that it's a Bowen mount, the, um, the protective glass over the front of the 600D hits the back uh, lens element on this unit and it can't mate to the connector. So you cannot connect an aperture 600D or a 600X onto this unit. Now, the next thing a lot of you are gonna to wanna to know is how bright this unit is, uh, particularly if you're using it with a mirror projection system, for example. So I took a reading at three meters with the 19 degree barrel on, and I got 17,700 lux. Now, to give you some idea of where that stands, if you don't uh, calculate in lux, the head by itself with no modifier on it gave me 2,160 lux. So through the 19 degree uh, barrel here, you get roughly a bit over eight times the amount of light level than you would from just the head alone with no modifiers on it. All right, the next thing is it comes in at 4.2 kilograms and it takes standard B-size gobo. So you can use your existing gobo collection with this unit. Let's get into the negative straight away. I only really have one negative and that is uh, even with the light attached to the back, the unit is extremely front heavy. So that's not my negative. And the negative is in order to lock it into place, it has uh, teeth in the locking mechanism, uh, what's it called a rosette system. So what I don't like about that is when you're trying to tune the angle that you want it on uh, and you go to lock it, it'll usually jump up or down from that position. So I just want to explain why I find this such a negative. So you've got this optical system here that really allows you to fine tune the shape of your beam, even project patterns. And then you've got this locking system that limits your ability to fine tune where the light actually points. So as you can see there with the rosettes slightly engaged, you can see how steppy it is. So I, I just find that really dumb. You know, it, all this effort's gone into making superb optics and then you can't control, you can't fine tune where the light actually points. That's, that's just dumb. Now, I almost forgot there is one other negative. You cannot rotate the barrel. All right, let's get into the positives now. And the build quality is sensational. It really is solidly built. And the other thing too is the barrel doesn't get that hot. You know, compared to say uh, the Apertures unit running a 300D through it, this is nowhere near as hot as the Aperture 300 with its, with its projection mount. So I'm quite surprised how cool it is. With one exception, that is the gobo holder. That thing is piping hot when it comes out, so be careful of that. Uh, the next positive is how bright it is. So I had to play with it last night, so um, rather than tormenting my neighbours, I decided to point it into some trees. So as you can see, it's got plenty of brightness on it. Now in this setup, I'm running a gobo pattern from eight metres away in a daylight lit room. Now when I open up the blind, it gives you some idea of how it can actually compete with a sunny day. Now another plus is if you're going to use this with a mirror system or use it on set to put it through a diffusion frame. As you can see here from five meters away, I'm able to tune it precisely into a three by three frame. Now the optics, are they a pro or a negative? Well, you could argue either way and it really depends on how realistic you're being. Now let's compare this to other lights in this class. So let's say a Joe Lico or a Aperture 600D with its projection mount. This easily has way better optics, this system way better optics. But if you're hoping to dim it down and then use it to do say product photography, fine tuning work, it's not good for that. It's not a dado light. All right, so in terms of its class, in terms of its firepower, it's very clean optics compared to anything else I've used in this brightness, but it's not a dado. All right, so let's go through how much it costs and what you get for your money. 
So it sells for about 630 US dollars, which is roughly about 1,000 Australian dollars. Now for your money, it comes in a very sturdy road case. Now everything inside the road case is really well laid out and the padding is superb. There's no way this is gonna get damaged, even by Qantas baggage handlers. All right, so inside you get a kit of gobos to get you started. So I'm not sure if this comes with four or five gobos, but you've got a Venetian blind. You've got, I don't know what that is, a star pattern, I don't know. Um, you get a dapple for your backgrounds. Now, if you're wondering where you'd use a dapple, out of focus, it's quite handy. It just breaks up the background a bit. You've got a tree pattern, and quite possibly, I'm not 100% certain, it might come with a Nanlite logo. I'm not sure if this was just chucked in for my video. Now, you also get the gobo holder. You get the gel holder. You get an instruction book. And of course you get the projection mount. Now one thing I do like with this projection mount is it has a lens cap on the back. Now that's pretty straightforward, but it's the first time I've seen a light come with a cap on the back. That would be very handy if other manufacturers would do that. Now when it comes to mounting this thing on a stand, the receiver here can mount to a junior or a baby stand, but I would strongly suggest getting a combo head stand. Um, not just for weight, but if you're using a projector mount, you're trying to do precision work. And if you've got a lightweight stand, it's gonna shake around and wobble on you when you're trying to line up um, your projection. So I would suggest getting a combo stand for this. All right, so let's go through how to operate this. Now, if you already know how to operate it, you can skip to the next section. So just go to the description below and you will see a timed index. Just click on the time code point and it'll skip. All right, so your Forza 500 or Forza 300 just mounts onto the back. Now, I would suggest putting the projector uh, unit onto a stand first and then mounting the light. That's just my preference for how to make it easier. Now, before you turn the light on, one thing you really want to do, particularly if you've got a high-powered light like a 500, is you want to open the leaves here, the blades. Okay, so if you have those blades shut, uh, all the heat from the CAB will get trapped into this section. And if that goes unnoticed, you could do some damage. Now, I just want to show you here, um, I'll very quickly uh, close the blades up. Now, there is nothing apart from the fan noise to indicate that this is turned on when you're looking at the head. So there's no spill light because it's a very well-contained unit. So it would be very, very easy to uh, have the light turned on and pumping into a closed uh, set of blades. So just get in the habit, whenever you put a light on a projector, open the blades before you turn the light on. It's always a good habit to get into. All right, so let's talk about these blades. Okay, so the blades are what you use to shape the light. Okay, so everything's upside down and back to front with ellipsoidals. So the top one, that does your bottom cut. Your bottom one does your top cut. Left is right and right is left. Okay, so they're your controllers. Now, if you just had a set of barn doors on the front, it wouldn't cut it, it would just reduce the light level because optically these don't work like that. The optical sweet spot is here where the, the cutter blades are. All right, so let's work our way forward. So just forwards of the blades here, there's a little slot and that's for putting in your gobos. So your gobos have a gobo holder. So you just slot the gobo into the gobo holder. Now these take a standard size B gobo and this is a Roscoe size B gobo. So you're not just limited to brand specific, there are thousands of gobos out there that you can pick from. So Google Roscoe and size B gobo and you'll see what I mean. Now I just wanna show you something here. So this is a gobo that I don't think has been used with a high powered light or a hot light yet, judging by the lack of burning on it. So. When you put a new gobo in, it might smoke. So let's just have a look, see if that happens. That's making a, oh, there we go. They're getting a fair bit of smoke. So if you're going to work, <laughs> that's a lot of smoke. <laughs> so if you're going to work in a location that has smoke alarms and you've bought gobos specifically for that job, you might want to burn them in first. So that's, this is not anything that's unusual. This happens with hot lights. Now, if you're LED generation and you never used tungsten lights, you've probably never seen anything like this happen. In fact, uh, the first couple of 
uh, hours that you have the unit, I would suggest running it with the blades closed a little bit so you can do some burn in on those as well, just in case, because I have had made the mistake in the past of when I was young, I went to a location and didn't burn in a hot light first and I set off the smoke alarm and a couple of fire trucks came, very expensive day. All right, so that's our gobo slot and we've got uh, this our blades here. Now, how do we focus everything? Well, on the front of the barrel here, or on the barrel underneath there, you've got a lock that you undo, and then the whole lens barrel moves forwards and backwards. All right, so let's have a look at that. So you can have your gobos out of focus, or you can put them into focus. Okay, so that's how you focus them. Now, you can use your gobos in conjunction with your cutter blades, but there is something to note, and that is, the cutter blades are not on the same focal plane as the gobo. They're a little bit backwards from where the gobo is. So you can have your gobo in focus, or you can have the cutter blades perfectly in focus, but you can't have both perfectly in focus. That's a bit of a problem with physics. All right, so let's continue working forward. So in front of the gobo slot, there's another slot which is under a door. And that slot is for your iris. Now, I don't have the iris to show you. Now, the reason that's under a door is it's quite a big slot. So the door's to mask any spill light that you might get. All right, let's go down to the front now. And in the front here, we've got accessory slots. And in here is a gel holder. Now, something I really want to point out, put your gels here in the front. Do not, under any circumstance, put them into the gobo holder. Okay, so I've had people do this on rentals and it melts. So you might have got away with it in the past with small projection mounts, but something this powerful is going to melt this gel. And I'm telling you, it is a nightmare to take one of these apart and clean all the glass. All right, so let's go through what I found uh, testing the optics. So the optical sweet spot of this unit seems to be where the gobos go in. So that makes perfect sense. Now, all of the blades act independently of each other, so they're all spaced differently. Now, the bottom blade, which is your top chop, because everything's upside down and back to front with one of these projectors, the bottom blade is the furthest blade away from the gobo slot. So what I've found is with this uh, bottom blade here, if you've got your lens set to project focus a fair distance away, like, say, further than five metres away, you can't get a hard focus on this bottom cut. You know, the other blades, you can get a real sharp cut on them, but this bottom blade, it's a bit dull. So here's what I mean. So this is actually the cut from the bottom blade. Now I've got this in focus as best as I can, and you can see it's not as sharp as the cut from the other blades. Now with the blades, it is possible to get some very fine cuts, but if you're going to use it for close-up work, there is some chromatic aberration or color fraying there. But when you look at it from about a meter away, it looks really clean. Now, if you're doing a cut that goes across the width of the beam, you get these little nicks of light at the end. Now, to show this off, I've really defocused the beam here to get it to flare out. Now, if you've got sharp focus, this is about as bad as it gets. But it doesn't seem to be a problem with gobo projections. Now, you can get around this by just chopping in the ends a little bit with the other blades but it does give you the creative limitation that you can't have straight lines on a fairly narrow cut and have a curved edge from the edge of the barrel. Now, all of the blades are very free moving and independent of each other and have plenty of overlap for creating shapes. Each blade is capable of going past the center point of the projection. Like every other ellipsoidal lot I've come across, it does have ghosting in the beam. So when you cut the beam, you can make out where the rest of the beam would have been. Now this ghosting has a slight green hue. Now if you're doing cuts and exposing right into the shadows and letting the light from the projector heavily overexpose, you can actually see the blades moving around. But I do feel I have to point out that if you expose your image for the highlights, you're never going to see any of this. Now if you're using complex gobo patterns that have a fairly even distribution of light through them, you do not see this ghosting regardless of your exposure. Now in terms of spill light, here I've overexposed the blacks so you can see how much is present. There is definitely a second outer ring of spill light. Now, in terms of real world application, using this on a location, I don't think any of these issues are gonna come into play, but I feel I need to point them out because you definitely couldn't use this for tabletop product photography work. Now, in terms of concaving or convexing, there is a very, very slight amount of concaving. 
but you've really got to be looking for it. Now to help you figure out what is concaving from the optics on the projector and what is concaving from my camera lens, I've lined the edge of the projector up to the lines on my garage. Now here I'm using circles to check that size and shape is uniformed across the beam, which it definitely is. But the edges of the beam are not as sharp as the center. Now this seems to be regardless of how close or how far away you're projecting the image. I've got to say though, it is pretty remarkable that I can project an image this sharp from half a meter away. Now here I'm using a Venetian blind gobo because these are a good indicator for sharpness across the beam and any concaving or convexing issues really show up. So in this, you can see the top and the bottom of the gobo are not as sharp as the rest. Now, in terms of focusing and defocusing, chromatic aberration and color fraying is there, but it's what I'd consider to be very minimal. Now, it's one thing to be really picky in my workshop, but let's do this in a real location and see if it actually is an issue or not. Now, color fraying is present, but you've really got to look for it. And to give you an idea of the light level we're getting, have a look at how bright it is outside. All right, so hopefully I've given you enough information for you to figure out if this projection mount is gonna do what you want it to do when it's paired up with your Forza 500 or Forza 300. I'm Andrew Locke, see you on the next episode of Gaffer and Gear.